Okay, so just the housekeeping pieces now before we get started. So in terms of the audio portion, this webinar begins with all your phone lines muted, even our co-presenters, so presenter, um, even me. So to unmute your phone, um, you will simply press star seven on your phone if you're going to ask a question or something like that. When you're done presenting or asking a question, you press star six to remute your phone. And if there's ever a time that Ashley wants us to unmute all the lines for open conversation, we'll give you a heads up so you can stop multitasking or, you know, as we all do. Um, we ask that you not place the webinar on hold at any time. If you do have to step out, just keep the phone muted or disconnect your phone line and do call back in. Polling. Today's talk has three opportunities for you to respond to slides with polling questions. We love data. To respond, simply click on the answers that make sense for you and don't forget to press the submit button. Archive. We are recording this webinar, as you noticed, and it will be archived for later access. And if for some reason you are disconnected and can't come back, you'll have you know, you'll be able to tap into that archive, or as we said before, you can call right back in and rejoin. At this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Ashley Harai to open her webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining. Um, as Maureen said, we're really excited for the course this year, and this just provides an opportunity to, to orient you all and um, uh, also provide an introduction on behalf of the Bureau. Um, and yeah, we want to make it interactive, so we do have three polls, and please, um, I will probably open up the lines on a couple of occasions, and also uh, just enter any questions that you might have in the chat box, and I'll ask Maureen to, to monitor that um, if I'm not uh, on top of that. I'll also just caution that I am working from home, and I do have a nine-month-old and a dog, so I apologize, apologize in advance if we have any distractions, so finger, fingers crossed there. Um, so let's get started. Again, this is really just providing that course background and preparation, a little bit on the purpose and history of the course, a description of the trainee class, and uh, what to expect from the course, a little bit on additional training and data resources, and an overview of the, the Maternal and Child Health Bureau and selected initiatives. So for the course uh, purpose and, and history, really it's to build that state and local capacity for epidemiology and um, to kind of have that historical context, it really was in the late 80s that health departments first moved from providing direct services to really engaging in public health and those core functions of assessment, policy development, and assurance. Um, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1989 established a data monitoring and reporting requirements for the Title V Maternal and Child Health Block Grant. And uh, it was really then that states really started to request that EPI support and training. So CDC and MCHB partnered to really create the MCH EPI program. Um, and that really started with a state assignee program uh, where epidemiologists are assigned to, to different states. Um, and it's often funded by uh, the block grant dollars, and I'll cover that program a little bit later for those who aren't uh, as familiar. And currently there are 14 assignees. Uh, then the Bureau provided a State Systems Development Initiative Fund, also known as SSDI, uh, to provide funding for data capacity. And that's predominantly used to flexibly uh, support new data systems, linkages, analytics staff, um, and the needs assessment for the block grant. Uh, we also uh, started building the future workforce through funding to schools of public health uh, that emphasize MCH leadership and training. Um, and we have 13 schools currently funded. We added a doctoral training grant to support uh, PhD student dissertations that use state and local data. Um, there are eight schools and uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago where um, Kristen Rankin, the lead faculty coordinator, um, is, is a professor, is one of those. So that's uh, just to put in your hat if you're thinking of, of going back to school. 
Um, we also have several placement opportunities for those uh, currently in training or recent graduates. So the CDC um, and the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists have a, a fellowship that's two years for recent grads. And in the training class this year, we do have one from Hawaii, uh, Alice Yang, so welcome. Um, and we also, the Bureau sponsors a, a summer internship program called the Graduate Student Epidemiology Program uh, for state and local uh, placements for those currently in uh, graduate school. So if your department may need staff, uh, these are definitely programs uh, to, to look into. And we also jointly with CDC sponsor the uh, MCHFE conference. It used to be annual, now it's, it's biannual and um, merged with CityMatch, the leadership conference to really connect programs and data um, and really foster that peer exchange, networking, and continuing education. And finally, uh, we have the training course, which you all are part of, and MCHB started sponsoring that in 2002. And it's really unique um, in that it develops and trains the existing workforce within state and local health agencies, so providing that continuing education in broad-based fundamentals uh, to support the MCH planning cycle from needs assessment uh, to performance measurement and program evaluation and effective data presentation and translation. Um, it's not targeted to particular topics like those that are offered um, as pre-conference trainings, for example, at AMSHIP or um, the CDC MCHFB conference. So this slide uh, is really showing um, an, an evaluation of surveillance capacity at, uh, in MCH. And as you can see, over the last decade, we have had substantial improvements um, in capacity. Uh, those that have substantial to full capacity, greater than 50% of a scale increased from 43 to 73%, and those with minimal to no capacity in MCHFE um, declined from 25 to 6%. And so in, the, in this latest report from 2009 to 2013, uh, states and territories reported increases in the percentage of MCHFE leaders with administrative and scientific authority, um, 49 to 69 percent. The percent that had a master's degree um, increased there, 13 to 40 percent. Um, and the percent with access to various data sets also increased, as well as the number of peer-reviewed publications and other reports. Those are really positive improvements that we like to um, think are a result of all of those investments uh, jointly from CDC uh, and MCHB and other partners as well, and CHIP and CityMatch, of course. We still have areas for improvement. Um, only 37% of states had full, um, almost full or full MCHFE uh, and surveillance capacity, um, and only a minority of jurisdictions did the EPIs participate fully in policy development, so linking that science to policy um, and have access to important data sets. Uh, only about half routinely performed statistical tests, and only about a quarter routinely conducted multivariable analysis. And that's really uh, the point of this year's training course, this basic intermediate, to get those of you who are very comfortable with descriptive statistics um, to really gain that proclivity in, in multivariable analysis that really helps to support program evaluation um, and really identifying trends and um, the content of, of interventions. Uh, the, the most pressing need, again, uh, uh, was uh, additional staff uh, and training of existing staff. So that's really where um, the course and other investments uh, fit in. So our purpose here is to strengthen that cap capacity for state and local analysts to really take that data um, skills to inform and improve programs, taking that consequential epi lens. And so it provides this conceptual basis and statistical methods to support the planning cycle from needs assessment and prioritization uh, to that performance measurement, program planning, evaluation, quality improvement, um, et cetera. 
And we do this through uh, some webinars, both before and after the course. Uh, the, of course, the in-person training that we'll all be meeting in a couple weeks in Clearwater. Uh, we have exercises to really facilitate that learning and, and discussion, and also opportunities for individualized technical assistance, both on-site and after the course. So here are uh, the chief course faculty. Uh, we have Dr. Kristen Rankin, who is the faculty coordinator. Um, Kristen, I think you're on mute, but otherwise I would have you say hello. Um, I know she's really excited to, to meet you all. Um, Bill Schlappenfield, uh, he's uh, hopefully all of you have, have heard of him uh, in the field of MCHFE, um, and he, he'll be providing uh, a lot of the, the training on needs assessment, prioritization, and quality improvement. Um, he has well over 30 years of experience at many different levels um, from local and state health departments to federal to organizations like City Match and, and now in academia. We also are fortunate to have Pat Ocampo who will be providing that instruction on program evaluation um, and also has a lot of expertise in social epi and that's always an interest of trainees, social determinants of health who have actually added a lecture um, that she'll be providing on site. So all the faculty have a really um, strong uh, set of experience and skills, have won teaching and mentoring, um, advancing knowledge awards, and we know you're going to learn um, so much from them. Uh, I will have a little bit of a role in, in having uh, a one lecture and some co-teaching uh, and also being able to provide that technical assistance on site. For course logistics, you heard from Maureen already and um, have been communicating with her on your travel arrangements as well. Uh, we're really um, lucky to have her. She's our, our logistics guru and um, coordinates everything uh, and helps us get there to, to Clearwater and make sure we have what we need for a successful and effective training. So thanks, um, as always, Maureen. So just a little bit on course preparation, we do have these webinars. Next week uh, we have one that um, Kristen will be providing on the statistical and epidemiologic framework, so kind of a refresher uh, to get you prepared for the course there on the stats background. Um, and we also have some required and optional readings. I believe there are four required readings, um, and that's really preparation for some on-site exercises uh, with needs assessment and evaluation. And we've also added a bunch of optional readings on that Google Drive. Uh, we've gotten feedback in the past that it, it's helpful for those who may um, want to prepare and um, tackle some additional readings either before or, or after the training for more learning. So on site we do have a, a range of lectures. I think you have the, the the final calendar and agenda. Um, so we have all of this great content here um, and we have exercises embedded into all the lectures to really um, be able to check in and test uh, your, your learning throughout and really make it a bit more engaging and interactive. We also will have some clickers on site. Um, we started that last year and uh, that's kind of a neat uh, way to get some automatic feedback um, so kind of polling with individual clickers that you have. Um, and we'll have three small group exercises as well for a needs assessment and an evaluation. We also have uh, that time for faculty Q&A and individualized technical assistance uh, Tuesday through Thursday on site. After the course, we have uh, probably two webinars, and at the end of the on-site training, we'll really query you to see uh, what your priorities are for those two. Um, these are some potential options that we may add to that on-site after hearing from you as well. Um, and again, we've, we do have this ongoing technical assistance to be able to offer you from all of the faculty, um, and that you know, extends uh, well beyond uh, one year. Uh, you can always reach out uh, for assistance uh, on projects or to find a certain resource 
uh, the, the faculty have a, a range of, of excellent expertise and, and are always willing to, to help. We do have a, a one-year evaluation then uh, that will clear you on uh, your current employment, any technical assistance you sought, and your satisfaction with it, uh, the skills that you've acquired or strengthened, and some examples of projects or, or products uh, that have been en enhanced as a result of the training. Uh, and so this is really the evaluation after the course and both on-site after each lecture. We really uh, use that for continuous quality improvement. Uh, as well as to be able to defend the program um, and, and justify its continuation. So we definitely use that feedback and, and the evaluation material. Uh, and here are some examples of how we've used your feedback uh, or the feedback of previous trainees. We've been able to really alternate the, the skill level because we realized that there's a, there's a range of skills and in any given year um, a quarter might be bored uh, and a, a quarter might not be able to keep up. And so we really targeted and focused the training um, uh, around certain skill levels from basic to intermediate and then intermediate and advanced. So there may be an opportunity for you all in this basic and intermediate year to potentially attend in a future year um, to, to extend that training. And, and that intermediate advanced really has more advanced uh, epi techniques with different regression modeling. Um, as a result of feedback, we also have a, a advanced sign up for individual technical assistance. And you all got an email earlier this week from Maureen soliciting um, those topics so that we can better organize uh, and make sure uh, that you get that uh, time on site. We consistently get a lot of feedback about having more networking opportunities. And, and so we have made uh, time for that uh, at lunch, trying to organize uh, trainees by different topics or data sets that you might work with, um, and a group outing as well. So on site, we'll probably uh, go out for dinner one night, and we're still trying to, to set that up. But that's always something that's well received to really get to know one another. Um, and be able to share tips and tricks and tools with, with each other on common projects. Um, last year, we actually got uh, a request to have a photo roster, and that's why you were all uh, requested to provide that. And that, I think, will really help to um, get to know each other and, and help break the ice so you can kind of look and see what somebody's um, name is and feel comfortable kind of going up and um, approaching them. We also strive to, we consistently get a feedback that there's so much that we're trying to cram in, so we consistently are trying to really hone in on uh, and concentrate on fewer topics in, in greater depth. Really thank Kristen for her work on that and organizing the, the content, of course. So here are just some examples uh, from previous trainees uh, of what they've uh, gained from the course. So here um, is at the top, um, one of the best skills uh, I acquired was to use perineal periods of risk, and that will definitely be in this year's course. Um, and so that came in handy uh, to this person in helping um, their state or county to implement that and identify kind of upstream uh, and downstream determinants to help address infant mortality. Um, another example here, working on the Title V needs assessment and really using the content to help us uh, set objectives and targets. Um, another example of adding a section to an annual birth report that shows the number of infant deaths attributable to disparity. So really, we have a lot of content on um, different methods and techniques and effective data presentation and, and translation that uh, is frequently um, used and reported um, in that one-year evaluation. And finally, just an example of someone who was able to publish a paper um, and got uh, a lot of help. The instructors really helped to clarify um, this person's thinking on how to approach it and what pitfalls to look for. So there's just kind of a range of 
some great uh, success stories that we hope you can extend um, and provide to us uh, in about a year from now. So about you all, this class of 2017, um, just so you know, it was a very competitive process. We get a lot of applicants. I think this year there were 170 um, and 43 trainees, so that's about you know, one in four that we were able to accept. So you're a really uh, select group there, and congratulations uh, to all of you. Um, you all come from 30 different states uh, or territories. Um, 23 are in state and territorial health departments, 11 in city or county, so local health departments, uh, two in tribal epi centers, two community-based organizations, and, and then two federal staff and university staff who are supporting state and local programs. Uh, the average age was about 33 and a half years. Um, and as is typical uh, in public health um, in general, there's a, a bit of a skew towards um, female. We have uh, over 90% there, 40 are, are women. Um, and we have three, three men this year. So here is a map of where you all are located, uh, really across the country, coast to coast, in every uh, HHS region. Ten states uh, had multiple representatives, so the, the darker shades of blue there. Uh, Ohio and Florida um, had three or more. Florida had five, actually, and that makes sense. That's where we're hosting the training. Um, and we also have two jurisdictions represented, American Samoa and uh, the Federated States of Micronesia. So they will definitely uh, win the travel award for, for longest flights all the way out there um, to Florida. So we have to be extra kind to them. They're, they're, they'll be on, you know, traveling many time zones and um, having, having some jet lag. So we also uh, had seven states there uh, indicated by the hash lines that have trainees um, at both state and local levels. And uh, we really like to, to foster that collaboration and synergy uh, between the state and local. So we, we hope you'll connect on site uh, and be able to share that context um, in your state. Here's just a word cloud um, of some of the programs uh, and data that you all listed in your job responsibilities. So you can see, um, based on the size of the word, uh, what some of the most common themes were here, and infant mortality, uh, the block grant, home visiting, PRAM, uh, were really common um, uh, programs there that, that you're working on, or, or data sources. And these are all areas um, where we'll try to create those uh, content table tents to organize you um, in, in lunches so that you can talk about some common areas and, and programs of interest to you all. And for the technical assistance, um, these are just some of those that you may have mentioned in your application. Um, but again, we did send that email to get a little bit more detail on what you're looking for. Um, so we can make sure to assign you to the appropriate faculty member and potentially group uh, those that have some common uh, questions. Um, those are some of the common themes there that, that could be addressed on site through the, the TA time or potentially also as a post-training webinar. So just some tips for getting the most from the course are really to attend the webinars you all are on right now, so that's great. And, and really using the, the opportunity to focus really for a week there um, in Florida. It's a rare opportunity um, to get that extended time to really focus on your development, enhancing uh, the skills. So really trying to see that we know that you have other job responsibilities that you may have to check in with um, at, at night or occasionally um, during the day, but we really hope you can um, use that opportunity uh, to really focus on that training and your development. 
Um, the networking, uh, that is consistently what we find to be so valuable uh, to the trainees and, and really sh sharing those tips uh, with each other. And again, we have uh, an opening reception where you'll start to mix and mingle, um, and then these lunches throughout the week, as well as um, that outing that we'll, we'll try to organize for everyone. Uh, and there, there are you know, lifelong friendships, I think, that have been established as a result of the course. So uh, that peer-to-peer -peer exchange is really so valuable. Um, and there will be a lot of material on site. Um, some may be a stretch, and that's why we've provided um, additional readings to really um, help grasp uh, some material and extend your training. But also feel free to uh, delve into uh, any of the topics that we cover on course in that on-site um, TA session. So we will leave some time for spontaneous um, TA that, that the faculty are more than willing to provide um, during those sessions or in breaks. And definitely we have to um, ask questions to really understand the material and, and help each other learn as well, um, and, and making sure that you speak that TA both during and after the course. So now we have just a poll here to check in with you on what you're most looking forward to uh, during the training. And it probably is all of the above, but I'm making you uh, make a selection here. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close that poll. Looks like we have a lot of good responses there. Um, so the most commonly selected is enhancing your skills, and that really is the purpose of the course. But of course, there are a lot of other benefits, and, and some of you selected meeting, meeting other trainees. Um, one person, I'll have to confess myself, I, I did enter the beach, uh, Maureen, is really great in, in getting this excellent location, a brand new hotel right there on the beach. Um, that will be probably a, a tempting distraction for everyone. So uh, we just may have to do a little peer monitoring of each other to make sure we're attending you know, all the sessions and there will be plenty of time uh, to enjoy that, that the, the surrounding area. Um, after five, there will be quite a bit of sunlight um, and, and before and after the training as well. So just for some additional training and data resources, um, our bureau sponsors uh, a series of webinars, the Data Speak, uh, that features topics related to different data sources. Um, some recent examples uh, were one on maternal health um, and rural disparities. We also sponsor another set of webinars that really focus on different methods. Um, and so these are a couple of examples there. And they're all archived, so you can go to that link um, and, and find both of those webinar series and sign up to be on the listserv to get those announcements for both of those. Uh, we also sponsor an epidemiology writer, writing program. Um, so if you're trying to work on uh, a manuscript and you've kind of done some kind of interesting analysis or evaluation that you're looking to publish, uh, we do have assistance for that, whether it's uh, in doing a, a literature review, framing your question, or working on the analysis. We do offer assistance with that, and it has been historically underutilized, so you can find more information about that program um, at the link there as well. 
The Bureau also sponsors this MCH Navigator, which is really a one-stop shop that pools different training, trainings available uh, from a lot of different um, organizations um, and academic institutions. So it, it really is all right there for you. And there's different modules. Um, there's also kind of quick five-minute um, trainings you can do on different topics. Uh, you could do a self-assessment to, to see what you might um, want to bolster and uh, enhance in terms of your training. Um, and they do have these different bundles. And so you'll see epidemiology is listed there. And they have different trainings for uh, data users, which are typically program managers, um, as well as data makers, the analysts. Um, and several of our course, previous courses are archived there as well. And here are just some links to some additional training resources from partners. So CDC, they sponsor MCH Epi Grand Rounds, um, and that's a, a webinar series. And you can subscribe to that listserv. Uh, that's really critical for everyone uh, in the field, I think, to, to be a part of that listserv. Uh, to find out about different trainings and resources, um, and, as well as job opportunities. Um, AMCHIP has an archive of the annual skill building training from AMCHIP and MCHFB conferences. They also have a new technical assistance program as well. Um, City Match has a lot of great training on perinatal periods of risk um, and, and responds to TA requests as well. And mchfe.org um, is, is another resource uh, for peer exchange. Uh, and you can find different codes and really post questions if you're looking for a resource um, uh, to their exchange system there. So all good to, to bookmark there. And here's just a question uh, of whether you've attended the City Match or MCH Epi Conference in the past. Okay, so looks like about a quarter of you have attended. Um, and so that's what we really hope that uh, in the future you'll all be able to attend and really present some of uh, the analyses you might be undertaking as a result of this training. Um, and it's such a great opportunity for that. Uh, peer exchange um, and continuing education. There's a lot of cutting edge topics that are always um, discussed uh, currently like Zika um, and, and severe maternal morbidity um, has been getting uh, a lot of traction. It's uh, Maternal Health Month, I believe, or it just was. Um, and some of our trends have not been going in, in the right direction there on, on maternal morbidity. I definitely encourage you all to attend uh, this. The next one is a City Match Leadership Conference um, in Tennessee, in Nashville, in September. You can find more information about that on the City Match website. Uh, and the next one in 2018 um, will actually be where I'm located uh, currently. I'm in Portland, Oregon, um, and really uh, looking forward to to welcome you, most welcoming you all uh, to my home base. The next couple of slides just have some links. Some of you, uh, these may be very familiar to, to many of you, um, but hopefully at least one you might not have heard of before. Uh, just in particular here, I'll just highlight this MCH Data Connect resource that's run out of Harvard. Uh, and it's pretty handy because you can actually sort or filter um, based on the level of analysis if you need county or even I think census tract you can get down to. Uh, it's also something you can um, search by topic as well. And the next set of slides just have 
some uh, links for common data sources that we work with in MCH, of course, vital records, um, census, WIC, Medicaid, uh, hospital discharge data, and different survey um, data resources as well. So PRAMS, uh, a number of you are actually PRAMS coordinators. Um, and those who are not, uh, it'll be great to meet your, some of your PRAMS coordinators on site. Uh, and, and that's where you can really obtain that state level data um, as well with YRBS. And, and then there are um, access points for raw data files for um, some of these other critical surveys, DRFSS, the National Immunization Survey, and the National Survey of Children's Health, which uh, the Bureau sponsors. And I'll just take a, a little moment to just um, talk about that, that there recently was a, a redesign which merged content from the National Survey of Children's Health and the National Survey of Children with Special Health Care Needs. And this really is a unique data source that provides both national and state estimates of uh, physical, behavioral, emotional health of the nation's children and their access to health care. And so it was recently um, merged and uh, it changed from a telephone-based survey to a mailed survey with an online response uh, really to help improve those response rates. Um, and we will have annual national estimates and uh, rolling estimates at the state level. Uh, and that will be released uh, to states for their national performance and outcome measures for the block grant uh, over the summer. And then the official release uh, will happen uh, in September. And we also have some new content on um, emerging areas like school readiness. Uh, so very exciting to, to be getting that data very soon. So now I just want to tell you a little bit more about the Bureau and, and the office I work, on, work in. I was kind of surprised uh, in the past that the training course, um, some people think that the, the Bureau is actually part of CDC, and we are um, sister agencies, uh, different agencies, but both part of Health and Human Services at the federal level. MCHB is part of the Health Resources and Services Administration. Um, also known as the Access Agency, and community health centers are really probably the, the largest uh, program there. And our mission statement is, is listed there. I won't read that, read that out loud, but it's really um, to promote the health of all of the nation's uh, MCH population, uh, including women, infants, children, adolescents, and those with children with special health care needs. 85% um, of the funding does go to that block grant to states, uh, and I'll talk about that uh, in, in a couple of slides coming up. Um, the rest goes to special projects of regional and national significance. So those are projects to support research and training like this course um, uh, and other uh, issues like genetic services, newborn screening, um, and treatment for uh, sickle cell and hemophilia are other examples. We also have communi community integrated service system grants that seek to increase local service delivery capacity um, and comprehensive systems for mothers and children. Um, promoting the medical home uh, is, is one example there. And finally, we have some categorical legislation, um, a healthy start and emergency medical services for children are two examples there. So here is our, our org chart here at the top. Uh, our director, uh, the associate administrator is Dr. Michael Liu. Many of you may be for, familiar with him. Um, he's a real visionary leader who's helped to uh, really transform a lot of our programs, uh, has a background as an OBGYN, um, and a lot of expertise in life course um, theory and perinatal disparities. So we have different divisions um, that focus on different population groups. Um, and there at the end circled is the Office of Epidemiology and Research where um, I am located. And just a little about um, our office, uh, Dr. Michael Kogan directs it. And our, our goals are to build data research and analytic capacity 
Um, so an, an example of that is that National Survey of Children's Health that I just mentioned. Um, the course is an example of, of one of the efforts to develop uh, the present and future workforce. Uh, we also conduct support and disseminate research to strengthen the evidence base, um, both through internal uh, FE programs as well as extramural grant program um, to uh, academic institutions to really um, build that evidence base on effective practices and, and identify emerging needs and priorities. And we provide analytic support and consultation to different bureau divisions and initiatives. And I'm going to provide a couple of um, overview uh, examples here from the, our largest program, the Block Grant, Home Visiting, Healthy Start, um, and the, the COIN. So the, the Title V uh, MCH Block Grant program was authorized as part of the Social Security Act in 1935, and it is the longest federal-state partnership uh, to improve the health of, of the nation's mothers and ch children. Um, and it really is the largest broad-based source of public health funding for MCH that also gets funneled down to, to local health departments through the state. Uh, it was consolidated as a block grant in 1981, um, and again, 85% of our funding goes to that block grant, um, and it is a four to three federal state match uh, that results in over $5 billion um, annually. Uh, so you can see how that really is the, the largest source of broad-based public health funding for MCH. And it's uh, for all 50 states and nine jurisdictions, uh, including the Pacific Basin. And states have to complete an annual report and application um, for this funding, and they complete a five-year needs assessment uh, to kind of set their priorities over a, a five-year cycle. Um, and, and that includes the, the range of the population domains for MCH. And there's the link that you can um, find more information about that block grant um, if, if you don't already know. Here are the, the legislatively mandated goals, and it's really uh, to improve access to quality care, um, and specifically mentioned is infant mortality um, and care for women in pregnancy, um, postpartum as well. And specifically um, kind of a call out for vulnerable populations with low incomes or those with special health care needs. And here's the classic uh, pyramid of services for MCH. So there are some direct services that are provided that are typically gap filling in cases of uh, not having insurance or under insurance. Um, and then these enabling services that help uh, individuals access service like, like case management, translation, transportation, um, as well as public health services and systems. So those promoting access to population-based services um, like newborn screening, um, injury prevention, um, and, and fluid uh, education and prevention are kind of examples there. And also the infrastructure to support public health. So uh, that's where we all fit in as epidemiologists to support that planning cycle and the needs assessment and evaluation and quality improvement. We recently underwent a, a transformation of, of the block grant and um, that was really designed to improve accountability and document that impact by having fewer performance measures um, and really being able to track performance in relation to activities. We wanted to maintain flexibility, um, having a choice for the first time in national performance measures, eight of 15, um, and states continue to be able to select their own state-specific performance measures and quantify their activities in these evidence-based informed strategy measures. Uh, we also tried to reduce reporting burden by pre-populating those performance measures um, wherever possible. So 
really freeing up the analytic staff to, to focus on the needs assessment and identifying um, priorities um, and, and evaluating uh, programs. This is just uh, the, the new framework. Um, where you can see at the heart here we have these national performance measures, which are in an evaluation logic model considered short or medium term outcomes. So examples of these are behaviors, um, access to care that ultimately influence longer term outcomes um, like morbidity and mortality. Um, and then the activities and strategies that states undertake uh, are quantified in these evidence-based strategy measures, which are really capturing process inputs and outputs in the evaluation logic model. So just briefly here are the, some of the national outcome measures. A lot of them are morbidity and mortality indicators from vital statistics and from our national survey. Um, we also have some indicators that are really legislatively mandated like prenatal care. Um, and emerging topics like school readiness is a developmental indicator that we'll uh, finally be able to have some data on this year with the new survey. These are the performance measures that are organized here by population domain. Um, and these are predominantly, again, behaviors like breastfeeding um, or access to care like the well woman visit. And these evidence-based informed strategy measures um, here, we'll probably talk about this more on site, so I'm just going to uh, skip over that. But um, I will just open it up quickly if anyone wants to talk about uh, a performance measure they selected or um, a, a strategy that they've been able to quantify um, as a, an ESM is what we're calling them. And to do that, if you want to unmute your phone, just press star 7, everyone and then star six when you're done. Is there a question? We're just opening it up if anybody wants to talk about um, either at the state or local level. Um, uh, a performance measure that the state has uh, selected that you may be working on um, or a, a strategy that you've been able to quantify um, as a measure. But I don't hear anybody chomping at the bit here, so we'll just move on in the interest of time. And we'll talk about more of these uh, on site. Uh, this is just an example of how the performance measure framework would work that here are um, some strategies. So you might have a social media campaign that you quantify um, by the number of media advertisements or hits to uh, a campaign website. Um, and hopefully these improvements in practice uh, will lead to improvements in behavior. Um, so safe sleep behaviors and ultimately those outcomes like uh, infant mortality there. The Title V Information System has a, a wealth of data here on a state's priorities, so you can go on there to look at their, their state action plan as well as the performance measures they've selected. And here's just one for Florida um, that they selected the well woman visit. Uh, Healthy Start uh, is, is another program, and you can kind of read the slide. We do have limited time, so in the interest of time, um, there, there are links there. But it's predominantly a, a case management program for pregnant women to really help uh, improve perinatal outcomes and reduce disparities. And home visiting uh, is another program that follows uh, children from birth to kindergarten entry and really trying to improve that child development, um, working on uh, those benchmark areas for improvement there and that really may have life course uh, impacts and helping to improve um, family economic self-sufficiency, for example. A little bit about COIN. Um, uh, a lot of you uh, may have heard about it or are participating in different COINs. 
There's a, these are just uh, some slides that, to talk about what a coin is. And really, it, it began um, focused on infant mortality um, with the 13 southern states. And it really emerged from state demand and desire to engage in collaborative learning um, and really exchange those best practices to reduce infant mortality and improve birth outcomes. Uh, it's a partnership with the state, with the Bureau, and, and other um, organizations and, and public-private partners. And so a COIN is a collaborative innovation network. Um, that's the origination of it. Um, it was developed by Peter Glor at MIT, um, and it's been described as a team of, kind of self-motivated people that have a common vision and uh, are working together um, to achieve shared aims and goals by exchanging um, information and ideas uh, through a virtual workspace, so a cyber team, um, and really fostering that innovation through rapid and ongoing communication at all levels and uh, really having that transparent and open uh, contribution. So this concept was adapted to add a second I, so not just innovation but improvement. So that's really adding the quality improvement lens um, to improve uh, the, the scaling of uh, best practices that we may already know of um, in addition to innovating and um, kind of identifying new strategies. And so it really is both a platform having this um, virtual learning space uh, and a methodology uh, to provide that um, quality improvement um, techniques and, and foster that innovation and collaborative learning. This is kind of the structure of it, having state teams, strategy teams, and, and these were the, the common priorities that were identified in the summit. So these were strategy teams that states uh, worked along with leadership at all levels. Um, it involved different content experts and data experts along these different strategy teams as well. Um, and, and folks were able to exchange those ideas through a shared workspace and data dashboard. So you, through this um, process, you can identify aims, strategies, and measures and really track that progress um, over time. So data is really critical to that effort um, to really have that motivation and see that success. And we actually were able to see a lot of success in particular with early elective delivery. So this slide really just shows that, that there was overall 30% total decline that translated to 85,000 um, early elective deliveries averted, um, and uh, that was a huge success. And you'll probably see this slide again, because Bill Sappenfield actually um, was the, the data expert for this team, and we'll talk about this uh, in the quality improvement lecture on site. So the COIN did expand nationally um, and uh, maintain some of those original strategies but uh, added one on social determinants of health, which is really exciting to see. I'm um, really innovating and trying to scale some policy um, and program and place-based strategies uh, to address social determinants, um, which you know, are the fundamental causes that can um, you know, improve maternal, infant, and health throughout the life course. So we actually now have coins across the life course, in fact, and uh, some people feel a bit coined out or coin collecting at the state level, um, but it really is uh, just there as a resource and a platform to really engage in that shared learning and achieve accelerated improvements in, in a short time period, 18 to 24 months. So I just have one final poll here uh, about coins that you may be participating in. Okay, 
So it looks like um, a, about a third are working on the infant mortality. That was the original and largest uh, coin, um, and uh, some in a variety of the, the others as well. And then about a, a third that are not participating um, uh, yet. And um, as they might have learned uh, something about this model, um, certainly just engaging in quality improvement in, in general um, is definitely increasing in the field. So just to wrap it up, I know we're at the top of the hour. Um, one thing to just keep in mind that we'll be instilling throughout the week on site is, you know, you'll be learning about a lot of new techniques and methods um, and they kind of are, seem alluring, but just make sure that um, we really have a purpose for using any of those methods that we're learning uh, and they're really should be connected to informing and evaluating programs. And that's really our, our role as epidemiologists to you know, study the distribution and patterns of disease to optimize health and connect that to interventions. Um, and sometimes your question may be answered very simply through descriptive statistics, um, like identifying program targets and the who, what, when, where, and, and, and knowing when you might need the next step to the multivariable stats, which we'll be learning more of on site. And that's really to help identify those independent determinants um, of different outcomes that can influence the content of interventions or evaluate programs uh, and assess contributors uh, to trends and disparities to really inform um, programs and policies there. And these are just, you know, some tips for asking those questions, really knowing from the outset what the purpose is. It's not just to apply a fancy technique, um, but really having those stakeholders in mind who are going to use the information um, and making sure that it hasn't already been done um, and that it really is consequential, really connected to those programs, um, not just risk factor focused, but really quantifying uh, the population contribution of different factors to help prioritize um, where you're going to invest in programs um, and then uh, evaluate that impact and, and return on investment. And, and making sure that we have a, a consistent plan from the outset to, to make sure that we're disseminating and using um, our analyses and that will also be you know, discussed on site uh, with that knowledge translation and effective communication. So um, thank you all for your time over the hour. Um, we all look forward uh, speaking on behalf of Maureen and um, Kristen and the rest of the faculty. We look forward to meeting you um, in just a couple of weeks and, and getting to know one another uh, in Clearwater. So safe travels and again, um, you know, we're looking forward to seeing you. Here's my contact information if you have any follow-up questions, but I also sent the slides over email. So, uh, Maureen, unless you have any final comments, I'll just sign off and, and let everyone um, get back to their, their day. Thanks, good. Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Safe travels, everyone.